Well, good afternoon if you are in New York or Pittsburgh or Buenos Aires. Good evening if you are in Albi or in Toulouse in France or Istanbul. Hello to our loved ones in Ukraine. Stay strong. We are with you. Greetings to people all around the world. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. Idajo, excuse me, is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers all around the world. My guest today is an old friend. His name is Sean Kelly. He is someone who works in the operatic vineyards and has for a very long time producing wonderful vintages, squeezing the grapes himself, and making opera better. I, I will put that in the general term, and we'll talk about specifically what he does. He is a conductor. He's conducted symphonic, vocal, choral. He's a pianist. He is a coach. He is what's known as repetiteur. He has added arts management recently to his resume. He's worked at the Metropolitan Opera in Seattle, Atlanta, Fort Worth, Wool Trap in the United States, the Accademia di Santa Cecilia in Rome, the Teatro Comunale Francesco Cilea, the Music Festival of Luca, and Istanbul, Turkey, the Istanbul Opera Festival, and Omaha, Nebraska which means that he is very, very well-rounded, and also a place that we will talk about in Brooklyn that was something of a shooting star in opera for a while called Loft Opera that we'll get into in a bit. But you join us tonight from France. Bonsoir, Sean. Ça va? Bonsoir. Ça va bien. <laughs> what are you doing in France? Um, my husband and I moved to Toulouse um, in January. Yeah. Um, it had always been something in the near future that we wanted to move back to Europe together. I'd lived in Italy for quite a while. He's French. Um, and we'd always discussed, you know, moving, moving together to, to live in France. And uh, just recently, very recently around Thanksgiving, uh, he was offered this really great job in Toulouse and we figured why not. And so we- So, and I'm, am I correct that you have a French bulldog? Uh, Francis is a Boston Terrier, but he's they a Boston look, they Terrier. Look but is he mistaken for a French Bulldog? In <laughs> no, because he's taller and okay. leaner. The Bulldogs are a little stockier and okay. shorter legged. Um, but, I haven't seen a Boston Terrier yet, to be honest. But I, serious I French question. All the time. <laughs> serious question. France is known as a place that's very welcoming to dogs. How has the experience been different? having your dog friend there in France as opposed to the U.S.? Um, lots of people, lots of our neighbors have dogs and they walk them. Um, and I, we, we have our, uh, the usual suspects that we bump into in the dog park every day. Um, they're not as apt to clean up after their dogs as, <laughs> as Americans are, um, even though there are stations with, with bags. Um, yeah. They um, go off. Uh, they go ignored quite often. <laughs> but do French dogs have admission to places that American dogs could not get into? Absolutely. Sam just sent me a picture today. He was having lunch, and there was a dog just sleeping on the floor in the restaurant, and probably the eating, have, you know, the the best baguette of its life. <laughs> the French have not died of illnesses of, of animal born illnesses. I know that's the point. <laughs> Um, we need to make our own do American dogs more welcome in a lot of places in the United States. That would States. be nice. Anyway, um, I want to start, we may as well start with the place where you and I met quite a number of years ago now. It was called Loft Opera. And Loft Opera was, in its time, a phenomenon. It, it changed opera in New York. It was, for many years, considered the most exciting, most cutting-edge place to see opera in New York City. It attracted attention from all over the world, really. Um, I was one of the first people to discover it simply because a young tenor student that I knew and had worked with a bit said to me, my friends are singing uh, Don Giovanni in a loft in the Gowanus part of Brooklyn. Now, Gowanus is basically a toxic waste dump. And it was 
you know, I've not been to Gowanus in maybe 50 years. You don't necessarily go to Gowanus. And nonetheless, this production of Don Giovanni, which is arguably the hardest opera to stage of all, was magnificent. And it was done on really no budget. They had a large jar of strawberry jam. And every time the Don or someone else got killed or killed someone, they'd stick their finger in the jam and do jelly across the neck. And that was the sign that someone had been killed. Very elegant, very to the point. The clothing was basically the clothing the singers owned. And the Don had the most elegant clothing along with um, the Commendatore. And Donna Anna had better clothing than Elvira, who had better clothing than Zerlina, and <laughs> so forth. And it was done in a space that was not necessarily congenial to doing opera. And yet it was phenomenal. And um, they then did many other operas by quite a number of composers. At what point did you join them? In, in which season of theirs? So if... I'm not mistaken, after Don Giovanni was La Boheme, and I joined yes. immediately after La Boheme. Um, and La Boheme, for people who may remember, in New York in 2011, there was Super Storm Stand Sandy, in which much of the southern part of Manhattan, a lot of Brooklyn, was badly damaged by water and there was no electricity, and there was mold on the walls. Mm -hmm. And Loftopper decided to go to one of these spaces in Brooklyn that had been completely ruined by water. And it was cold in there. And I remember that Mimi was really coughing, and I'm coughing thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And the smell of damp and of death and so on, it was, it was real. And you could really, when Mimi was dying and, and everybody was struggling to sing, um, it was very touching and very sad and also very sickening. And, <laughs> you know, even at that point, the company was acquiring its reputation. Um, it was founded by a brother and sister from California. And they came to New York and they had these ideas and they brought people around them, such as yourself, who were incredibly talented and they made it work for a while. And then we don't have to get into this, but it ran into financial troubles and so forth. But it was kind of a golden era for new kinds of opera production that influenced other companies. Talk about the loft opera style. And then I want to speak to you specifically about the productions you worked on. Sure. Um, I mean, talk about a cold venue. I've never... The Macbeth that we did, um, <laughs> I've never been so cold. <laughs> making or not making music in my life. I had gloves on. I had to buy, you know, those pots that secretaries use to like count money or to flip. Yep. And my fingers were covered in that sticky thing just to be able to turn the pages of the score. It was, it was cold. <laughs> Remind me, was that at the Brooklyn Navy Yard? That was in the Navy Yard in the, um, yeah. the chocolate Right. So in uh, other words, every time, almost every time Loft Opera did a new opera, they picked a different venue. Almost it's always, that, yeah. Almost always. It's not that they always went back to the same space. Mm. I saw two operas in Gowanus, but then they never went back to Gowanus. Mm -hmm. um, most of the, maybe all were in Brooklyn, in my experience. No, they and, were. Yeah. And it meant that the Manhattan crowd traveled to Brooklyn. The Brooklyn crowd were very chic <laughs> and edgy and, you know, ahead of the curve, so to speak. And, you know, the chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Opera came. I gathered that Peter Gelb, the general manager, attended once. He sure did. And it really attracted everyone. And it became the hottest ticket in New York and the New York Times eventually wrote about it i think i was the first person of what we might call media I think although i straddled because i work in opera and i work in media but not as a reviewer i was probably the first um and i started spreading word about it on wqxr radio and then other members of the media started coming and then it made all kinds of business magazines it, it got into different places that opera companies don't usually get to. 
and it had a fresh style and a young audience. Not everything worked equally well, um, artistically, I mean. There were a couple that I just thought didn't work, but same with the Metropolitan Opera in La Scala and the Paris Opera and every other place, but Loft's opera's batting average was very good artistically. Um, your production, I say yours because you worked on it, of Lucrezia Borgia, Mm. To me, was a real by Donizetti was a real highlight of the Loft legacy. Talk about that opera. So Lucrezia Borgia was the f- my second opera as as music director of Loft Opera. Um, we partnered with Etro, the Italian uh, designer. The designer, yep. Yeah. And the cast was costumed in in vintage Etro. Um, as it turned out, there was a suit that fit me, and the director was <laughs> had her heart set on me being costumed as well. So I got to wear a beautiful etro suit on opening night. Um, it's it was one of those. I mean, I feel like we had several um, during during my tenure, at least in Loft Opera, um, of just those magical moments when it's just the right group of people, and and it just a, a family is born, and we just we got dirty together. We lost our tempers together. We, I mean, we both know the budget was, you know, I think I have more money in the, in the corners of my sofa and change than, <laughs> than we had in these productions. Um, and we just, we just did it. We rolled up our sleeves. It was very like, you know, Mickey and Judy, let's put on a show. We have an international audience, Mickey Rooney and Judy Oh, Mickey Garland. Rooney and Judy Garland. Yeah. yeah. Let's <laughs> let's 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 put on a show. Let's do a show. Um and it just every so often it was just those magical moments that was the right cast and the right personalities. And you know, they were all really beautiful people. And you know, we perform in, in very unconventional spaces. Um, and a lot of times the audience is right up, you know, several yards away. So yep. um and there was beer. And there was always beer, and there was always beer bottles falling. That was just part of the acoustic soundscape. Of- but I mean that audience members could buy Brooklyn beer yeah. and sit there and drink Brooklyn beer. Absolutely. Um, and occasionally become lighthearted, let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> what it also <laughs> meant, to be put it in the, in the bluntest terms, is that at the intermission, there would be a mad dash for the restrooms because... They didn't often have formal restrooms. They may have had one sure. outdoor stall. Yeah. And it might be February in Brooklyn and freezing and, you know, yeah. in a place where a block away people were being shot at, mm-hmm. literally, yeah. in some of the, not the best neighborhoods of New York. And and yet everybody, audience members and so on, would make it happen. And the likes of me would come by subway. But you'd also see Park Avenue people coming with their limousines. Sure. And it it cut all across. It was very New York in that it cut across all the social and economic classes. And it was racially a lot more mixed. There were people of color of all different colors. Um, There was every permutation of sexual orientation and expression. Also great. And um, it was a happening. But, you know, these kind of happenings sometimes have their lifespan, sure. you know, even Diaghilev at a certain point stopped producing. So it happens. And it, it it was an important chapter in his life. And I think that many fine young singers came out of this and have gone on to good careers in other opera companies. Sure. Um, the likes of you, and there was a fellow named Dean Buck, and there were a few other people were very important in the musical formation of these young people because I can really think of just one production that I saw that I didn't like musically. That was the only one. Hmm. And I'm not going to name it, but there was just one and it happens. Um, But I remember that occasionally, because I was regular at these performances, that members of the cast would come up and ask me questions about how to do their interpretation. And is there anything that I would fix so I found myself sometimes coaching them during the intermissions. <laughs> but I don't remember his name, but the fellow who played Scarpia for your Tosca um, hooked his own steak. 
because Tosca, you know, fine, he's eating his povera cena fu interrotta. His meal has been interrupted by all the ado in the second act. And there's a knife in the steak. And I was consulted on which kind of meat to purchase that could be quickly cooked <laughs> so that the Scarpia could eat it. Because in your production, Scarpia cooked his own food, which he was practical. <laughs> sure. But um, another one I want to talk about is Rossini's Le Contori. Talk about, I mean, the space was particular, but also you talk about the the theatrical elements. I think it was probably the most elaborate theatrically of all the <laughs> loft opera productions. It was not strawberry jam and no, that, which no, was very we went, minimal. We went all out for that. So uh, Contori was in uh, another warehouse that housed a um, an acrobatic school, um, high wire uh, scarf, like suspended scarves that you would do. And when we would rehearse there, we would be in three quarters of the space, but there would still be a class happening. And, and the director and I, you know, and everyone else, why would we not exploit this? Why would we not integrate it? Because how fun is this? And so we had uh, two or three of their acrobatic artists dressed as nuns on the silks doing the thing as the audience members were filing in and getting their, you know, two handfuls of beer for the show. Um, we had nuns in hot pink with hot pink silks, mm -hmm. <laughs> acrobatics. And it was just, it was zany. I can't think of another word for it. <laughs> and one of those flying nuns was an usher at the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> and when I would go to the Met, I would see her and she would look at me knowingly and she would say, you don't recognize me, do you? I saw you because I went flying past you in a nun's habit. Um, she was one of the acrobats. And she's also an usher at the Metropolitan Opera and the orchestra level on the North Isle. And um, what that speaks to is that New York has a very vibrant opera community. I love the Metropolitan Opera, no secret about that. But there's so much more than just the Met. Sure. And between all the schools, such as Juilliard, Manhattan School of Music and Madison, many, many more schools, and all the small opera companies, even after the pandemic, when many were decimated, and even after the economic crisis of 2008, um, somehow we still have a lot of opera companies and a lot of talent, so that wherever you go, you see that. What I'd like to ask you about in that regard is, you are still a young man but you were a very young man when all of this was happening and you were basically the same age as the, many of the students that you worked with okay. and you were um simultaneously conducting them coaching them and so on but they were your contemporaries and you know it's not like carl berman and birgit nielsen being contemporaries when they were 60 years old it was that you were all 22 and 23 and 24. Talk, well, you were 26, 27, 28. Yeah, sure. <laughs> let's go with that. <laughs> all right. But talk about, I mean, this is La Vie Bohème in New York. Hmm. And New York is a city where the rents are very high, where things are very expensive. How, talk about the young artist life in opera when all of you were not making any money and, and had all this talent and eager to be noticed and could not all work at the Met, though you did work at the Met, but not everyone did. Talk um, about that, that whole milieu, because it's something most people don't know about, even here in New York. Sure. I mean, I think that played a big part in how close we were as, as a team, as a family that, that was doing these productions. Um, Like I said before, our budget was, little little to nothing and so i knew i wanted things to be at a certain level musically i certainly was choosing repertoire that was not simple to put together and so i just knew that i would coach anyone in the cast for as many hours as they wanted for as long as they wanted to get us all happy and ready to to go to that first rehearsal and so you know i would donate hours and hours and hours 
to get these ready, um, get get these artists ready, and we would, you know, we would work, and sometimes we'd have a coffee break, sometimes I'd make them lunch, and then we'd go back to work. It was all very, you know, what I would like to think it was like back in the, you know, in the 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the conductor was the feeling. one playing the piano during the coachings, and you start creating the role and piecing it together at the keyboard, and then you, be, you know, later go to the podium. Um, but there was a real um, fraternity, to, for lack of a right. better word. And uh, I want to point out something that is obvious to me, and I'm sure to you, but may not be to the listener. You had live, talented orchestral musicians. This was not opera at the piano. You no, had no, there was an orchestra. And you had to train, conduct the orchestra. You had to work with the orchestra and the singers. And sometimes you would have, let's call them reduced choruses rather than a full, full chorus. But you would have choruses that played their roles and, and mm. added to the musical values. That's a lot to do at the Met. And here yeah. you were doing it in cold spaces with mold and with you know, acrobats and, and, you know, little insects and pests running around. And, and um, you know, I remember those spaces and I was just there as a member of the audience. But I can only imagine what it was like in the dead of winter to be trooping out to a freezing cold venue in Brooklyn that um, was rather dodgy in terms of its safety. And yet all of you not only managed to do opera, I mean, the thing about loft opera, it never felt amateur, ever. It felt like all of you were very talented, including the brother and sister who founded it, and brought something much more to it than just, frankly, any other amateur, let's call it, opera company or mm -hmm. struggling opera company in New York City. Did you guys know that, or did... What was the alchemy that made this really very unusual? Um, I think it's youth had a lot to do with it and just that desire to be part of something bigger than yourself. And, you know, we all knew that it was going to be a great production. Is it going to be like the coolest thing that we do this year? Hopefully, sometimes not. But there was that desire to, to make music. Um, and... You know, we worked really hard. A lot of the orchestra members <laughs> couldn't stand me because they were miserable and I would still ask them for, you know, pay attention and articulation and dynamics and all that. And they're like, Sean, I can't feel my fingers anymore. My clarinet <laughs> just cracked. I mean, everything that could go wrong always went wrong. Um, but there was just that, you know, combination of youthful vigor and that desire to let's just really do a, a, a killer job at, at this. Yep. And it just worked. And then there was always free beer at the end of the and night. The, for you guys, it was free beer. Um, and we don't have to talk about the decline of Loft Opera. It lived its life. It went where it went. And then you, frankly, you were talented before. You had a lot of experience before. Um, this was a feather in your cap in your resume because it had been such a sensation that although you had wonderful credits prior, um, in New York City, at least, this was a degree of currency, and even beyond New York City. And more recently, you lived for five years in Omaha, Nebraska. I did, yeah. Which is a lovely city, actually, and could not be more different <laughs> in terms of its environment, its aesthetic, its cultural perspective than Loft Opera, or maybe I'm wrong. Oh, that's pretty different. <laughs> Talk about, because, you know, for people who don't know, people may not know that all over the United States, we have cities that have really wonderful, high-class, world-class opera. Uh, I had done, before you got there, I had done some program notes for them. And it's, it's a very well-regarded company that tended to build seasons into sort of festival form rather than spacing it out throughout the year. Is that correct? They went back and forth. There was a period where they had a festival and then they went back to a traditional season. And then my first two years 
with the company, they had what they called the one festival. So there was a fall production, a winter production. And then in the spring, there was this festival format, which was a main stage opera, a more, um, I don't want to say site specific, but a smaller chamber size opera. And then many other performances that happened in the same seven day period. Um, some were vocal by nature, or classical music by nature, some were not, many were not. Um, we sort of tried to incorporate all the different things that make opera. Some yeah. was just dance, some was film or video, some was, um, you know, vocal music or just chamber music. So that was fun, but um, it it only lasted two years. Unfortunately, COVID put a, put a wrench yeah. in it. Um, and then we, the company just decided to go back to a traditional season. And who was the audience in Omaha? Uh-huh. Which, by the way, Omaha is not the capital of Nebraska. That's Lincoln. Yes. But Omaha is the largest city. It is the largest city. And they're very close. They're only about 40 minutes in a car from one, one to the other. Um, the audience is a lot of your what you expect. Older, older white folks with money. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we tried to appeal to the college age. There are two universities, two big universities and, and other uh, schools in the in the Omaha metro area. Um, but it, I think we struggled to get young people there. It depended on the title. Yeah. Um, we did Sweeney Todd uh, two seasons ago, and that obviously was full of young people because of the you know brand recognition. Mm-hmm. With the the film and everything, um, but yeah, I, I I I think the demographic in Omaha could be could be younger. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's it, it's happening though. It's it's gotten better over the five years that I was there, and I think it will continue to improve. And you were, if I'm correct, your titles were head of music and chorus master. Yes. What is head of music? So head of music is one of those terms in the United States that almost company to company is a completely different job. Uh, it could be one of many different things. Uh, at Opera Omaha, I participated in season planning and casting in the long, you know, big picture stuff. Um, I assisted the guest conductors. Um, I would identify and help coach if somebody was, you know, lagging behind in a rehearsal. I'd talk to the conductor and I would maybe work with them or I would have the rehearsal pianist work with them or we would both take turns. Um, And then as, you know, course director preparing, preparing the course. Um, And sometimes all all three at once. (laughs) And who did casting? Um, Myself and the general director or or the um, director of production, the three of us kind of worked as a team. Because what I'd like you to address, because it's one of your skills among many, is programming, because programming in opera is much debated, Mm -hmm. often criticized, whether it's the big companies or the little companies, um, much misunderstood and very hard, because what you have to do is you have to decide what will sell tickets, what you can budget for, what has not been done lately, so that you don't want to do Traviata and Bohem if you did them last year, and you don't want to do Carmen again if you did it two years ago. And nonetheless, there's a segment of the audience that really just wants Carmen and Traviata and Bohem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and maybe Leonardo City Figaro, but to do um, something a little off the charts, like let's say Mozart's Domineo or Verdi's Simone Bocanegra or Puccini's La Rondine are fine works, but they're not the works that somehow grab the way those other operas grab. And Rossini wrote magnificent operas, and yet we always seem to see the Barber of Seville and maybe Italian Girl in Algiers or Cinderella. Sure. But, you know, I think there's a place for Hermione, just to name one of the I... many Rossini operas. Um, how? Oddly enough, sorry to interrupt. Um... Yeah. Opera Omaha did the U.S. premiere of Hermione. I know that. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Very unusual because I couldn't. That. I couldn't sell that title now. If I, I just look sleepy, dollars. but I'm really I'm on top of this. I wrote the notes. <laughs> um, it was 1992. 
That sounds yes. Like it. Yeah, I I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first. That's not the first time I went to Omaha. It's the second time I went to Omaha with Frere Mione, oh. and um, it's it's a wonderful work. But you just said I couldn't sell that now. What's different? I mean, a lot of things are different. It you know a lot depends on the creativity of the of the director. You know, if the general director feels a certain way about certain titles, at the end of the day, it's their decision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, name recognition does affect ticket sales. Um, so, you know, for a composer like Rossini, you could say, oh, well, if you like Barbara of Seville, check out Hermione or check out Semiramide. Um, but, um, you know, they're long. They could be costly, you know, with a cast of eight. That, yep. You know, but also, you know, you have to get someone to sing the roles, but then other people to be their covers or standbys. I mean, it's uh, with an opera like that, it's tricky to just get one cast. Exactly. <laughs> That's part of the point. So yeah. it requires more rehearsal time, sure. more budgeting that way. Um, mm -hmm. Or this is probably easier to do a bohem because you can I mean, find a there's like a Mimi across the street as we speak. Right, <laughs> right. You can find that anywhere, but um, it may not be as nothing gets la bohem, which is a perfect work, but it may not be as rewarding for a company, never mind their audience, but a company to do yet another bohem. Sure, and. That's why we, you know, we try to expand further afield. So with the case of Loft, before we get to Omaha, and then we'll talk about other places, how how was it decided what opera to do next for Loft? Well, Loft was unusual because it was so much, you know, me talking with, with Dean Buck, and, you know, there was a, a few directors that we would work with a lot. And, you know, one would do this opera and then, oh, this one has to be this director. What do you want to so do? So what you mean stage director? One stage of them directors. was Lane Retmer, who was very impressive. And John, and I'm suddenly forgetting his last name. John de los Santos. John de los Santos, who did excellent work. Yeah. Um, during my tenure there, we seemed to alternate pretty um, steadily between Lane and John. Mm -hmm. um, and I adore working with both of them. Um, and so, you know, we would kind of take turns with the director. Um, it just depended on what, you know, between the three of us, what we wanted to do. There wasn't, there wasn't too much forethought. We knew what we could do. I knew what I could do musically with the, with the budget. Um, and if the director agreed and the stage director agreed and we could, get both excited about the same show, then I would I would run off and I'd start either casting it in my head or mm -hmm. making sure that my friends were available if I had them in mind. Right. <laughs> and then I'd have to start sweet talking them and bribing mm -hmm. them if they weren't. <laughs> but there was a case where in New York City, you had more artists to pick from, but you didn't necessarily have much money to give them. In Omaha, they would pay competitive salaries for that level of opera company. Mm -hmm. There was a lot more security that the show would go on. Um, a lot of things just worked better because it was not so fly by night and Mickey and Judy sure. and all that. Um, so that you could do better planning in Omaha and think ahead sure. and think of singers you'd want, but therefore you might have to find a singer who would be available when you needed her. Hmm. And so, I mean, I guess my question would be that if you were to do Hermione in Omaha again and needed a really good mezzo, would you perhaps look for a mezzo of the level of Isabel Leonard, who is very well known and has a reputation to come do that? Or would you go for someone who may not be as well known and try to sell Hermione the opera rather than Isabel Leonard the mezzo soprano. Uh, it depends. Uh, there's a lot of um, 
in the best possible way, name recognition of artists in Omaha. And they really, they have their favorite soprano who really you'll see come back every few years. Um, and they're very uh, faithful to these artists. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you could get away with, you know, attaching, you know, maybe with Adamione, one of, one of the roles to a, a returning artist who, you know, is going to sell, sell some seats because yep. they're, they're loved in the city. Um, you know, I would, you know, reach out to Daniela Barcelona and say, listen, I will make you dinner five times a week because there's no good Italian food in Omaha. Uh, yeah, but actually Daniela Barcelona is a pretty good cook. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's those sort of husband. connections of, of, of friends or friendly yeah. gestures that I think go a long way too when you can't, when you can't get what you want True. <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> but actually talk about that because this is something I had a lot of experience with at the Met, that a lot of the making the artist happy came by feeding them. Um, there are people throughout the opera business. Evans Mirages in Cincinnati is a wonderful example of someone who's an excellent cook. And when I've worked in Cincinnati or been to Cincinnati, I've been around his table many times. And he was once feeding a whole cast of Tosca and cooking beautifully. And it made them happy. And it meant they didn't have to find their own food. Um Omaha, let's let's get right to that. Has fantastic steak. Did they you sure cook did. a lot of steaks when you were in Omaha? Yeah, but I mean, did you? Okay. <laughs> I I mean I try not to eat too much red meat. Um, yeah. But yes, every so often uh, we would go out and we would you know have a proper night Excellent. out of, of Excellent. you know I mean good people in Texas and Buenos Aires, but Omaha is pretty good for that. They're they're um, they're they're pretty good. So. I want to take you in an entirely other direction. When I first met you, you had already had a lot of experience in the nation of Turkey, not the food Turkey, but the nation <laughs> of Turkey. And I had no, I've known Turkish opera singers and I've known that there is some interest in opera in Turkey, but I'd never really met a non-Turk who has worked in it so much. What got you to Turkey and, and talk about your experiences of, doing opera in a nation that may not seem to be naturally given to opera, even though many operas are set in Turkey. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I was living in Rome and I had been there for about six years and it was feeling like, okay, I've, I've, I've lived abroad. I've done, I've done this cool chapter. I had a lot of fantastic experiences and I was, you know, feeling like I was ready to maybe move back to the States. And it was right after the, the crash and there was a lot of, um, you know, companies weren't just getting new music staff or anything. And my friends and colleagues that I spoke with said, Sean, if you could hold off another year, like things will be better. Um, and so the very last gig I had in Rome was uh, In Matrimonio Segreto by Cimarosa. And it was a tour and it was an Italian cast and myself, an Italian conductor and myself, and we rehearsed in Turkey, and we rehearsed in the Conservatory of Ankara, which is the capital, and that's also the headquarters of their opera. It's kind of like a Staatsoper system, so yep. um, it was, it was a, a government run. And so we rehearsed in the conservatory, and I, you know, on a break of a rehearsal, I was in the hallway, and and someone came up to me and said, oh, I was sitting in the back of rehearsal and I listened to you and you were running rehearsal and speaking two different languages at the same time and singing from the piano. And she said, would you ever w work in Turkey? She was the head of music of the, of the opera house in Anka. Yep. And I thought, well, no, I, I can't <laughs> speak Turkish. I, I'm yep. here as a kind of a tourist. I don't know enough about the country or how you how it works to say yes. I said, "Oh, that's really sweet. Thank you so much. I appreciate it." Um, I don't really, I don't have enough information to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. She said, "Well, give me your email address, and I'll have the artistic administrator send you a contract, like a dummy contract." And sure mm -hmm. enough, he did. And 
they were very transparent and they said this you want to stay in one house for the whole season fine if you want to let us send you where you're needed at the time there were i think seven opera houses in the country um or a mixture of both it's up to you this is what we pay it's the same for everybody um and then after some reflection and a glass of raka <laughs> i uh i thought you know what why not i have one more one more crazy adventure left let's let's move to turkey why not um and so i'm I went back to rome got my stuff a few months later started the season in um in ankara and and i did really do a bit i would maybe do two shows a three shows a year in ankara and then one in this two in assemble one over the summer is me i i traveled for for a bit so i was there for two seasons did you find that either the opera workers which is to say directors managers singers or the audiences had any ambivalence about some of the subject matter in some of the operas because we can pick just about any opera and they're doing things that would run afoul of certain religious practices sure um not the people that bought tickets to go to the opera those people knew and know and love opera for what it is um and they it was always always well attended and very well received mm -hmm. um the government however i don't feel <laughs> thinks the same way and even while i was there the rules because it's a state run entity the rules of what repertoire could and could not be performed or how much changed even over the two years that i was there so if it should be 75% european titles sung in the original language and 25% either translated into turkish or by turkish composers that started shifting into more operas translated more original turkish compositions um and you know that's all fine but it's not like turkey the country was producing all of this repertoire that they right. every company wasn't doing the same two titles over and over again they would do a lot of operetta translated into turkish um so it just it was a shame because i think the audiences were there for you know they want verdi and puccini and mozart and and they were not getting that over that period of time and i'm not sure what it is now but i know that it has changed with i have no doubt it has would offense have been taken in any opera that depicted Turks in particular ways, Rossini's Il Turco in Italia, uh, Mozart's Abduction from the Seraglio. No, that's a, one of the most popular operas. Abduction oh, is really? very popular. Zaida by Mozart is very popular Zaida, there. Yeah. Um, no, they don't. I mean, I they I did a Viva la Mamma while I was there, uh -huh. and they were all for the drag. That didn't bother them at all. <laughs> Okay. Like, unlike I, Tennessee. <laughs> um, no, unlike Tennessee. But, um, you know, I ask because unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe, opera and politics are closely linked. And opera has been used for propaganda. Um, opera has been used to challenge existing religious or political authorities. Uh, it's been used, whether in Milan or Brussels, to foment revolution and bring in Absolutely. new governments, new types of government. And not everybody sees it just as light entertainment. They see it as something that can really antagonize or animate the audience in ways that uh, oppressive authorities would not want. Mm. And I'm not singling out any country here because it's been used as propaganda in Germany and Italy and America, France, you name it, everywhere opera has been propagandistic, which is great, Russia, which is great, but it's also bad, depending how it's presented and worrisome. Sure. Yeah, I don't... I mean, the difference between now and, you know, during Verdi's time is that, you know, back then that was the thing there wasn't you know smartphones and cinema and cable television if you wanted to be entertained you went to the theater so i think the reach 
to to foment change was mm-hmm. so much more deep than it is now. Um, I wouldn't mind a little. I wouldn't mind if opera could shake a few things up, but I don't. I don't. I would like that. Do you? Did you in Turkey encounter particular challenges or pleasures working with Turkish opera singers? What did they bring that maybe you never encountered in other countries? So um, one of the actually the first question I asked when I was in the process of accepting the the job was, I am just about to learn the language. I cannot speak Turkish at all. And I was promised, oh, everyone in the in the theater speaks English or Italian, you'll be fine. That was not the case. Yeah. Um, and so for at least, it felt like longer, but it was probably four, four or five months. I had a notebook that I kept on the music stand next to me of how to say, you know, early, late, too soft, too loud, flat, yeah. sharp, all the things that I would say in a rehearsal. Um, even if I couldn't say it in a sentence, I could just point to someone and say, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the thing that was the most shocking, and this is just kind of a office culture thing, is that uh, they would rehearse musically for weeks before they would ever, and it doesn't matter what the opera was, before they would ever begin a staging rehearsal. Um, and because the contracts were the nature of the contracts, there's a lot of job security built in that maybe shouldn't exist or doesn't really function in the best way with performers. Um, there are people that knew they would have a job whether yep. they showed up to work or not. Um, there would be times where you know it would be the first day of music rehearsal with me and people would come in and crack open their brand new score that just came in the mail and they say, okay, mm-hmm. maestro, teach me this part. It's like, you're singing the lead role of like a very complicated Verdi opera. You didn't yep. want to practice it over the summer or like look <laughs> at it. They're like, oh no, I was at the beach with my family. Okay, good yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that culture of, you know, that sense of job security, there would be artists that would cancel every offer that they were given for the season. They'd show up to the opera house and smoke cigarettes and drink tea with their friends, but not go to rehearsal and they'd get paid just the same. That was hard for me to, as a very type A American, that was hard for me to wrap my head around. So, I mean, the part of the point here is that you've worked in different cultures and nations, each of which has its own way of doing things, even within the nation. So, you know, Loft and Omaha are two very different realities of opera. And you've worked at the Met in Seattle and Atlanta and Fort Worth and Wolf Trap. Talk a bit about Wolf Trap. I don't think everyone knows it. It's in Virginia. What is Wolf Trap? Wolf Trap was fantastic. I was only there once. Um, I wish I could have gone back. Um, it just wasn't in the stars. But I worked um, on Viaggio Arras, another. Rossini. Rossini is always always near and dear to my heart. Um, I was, uh, Gary Guido was the conductor, and I was the assistant and rehearsal pianist and coach. And uh, that's actually where Gary and I met for the first time, and we've become hard, fast friends. Um, but it was, you know, it's a young artist program. Um, so over the summer, they just have such a good finger on the pulse of of upcoming talent. I honestly, I don't know if I've ever been involved with a young artist production where so many people in that cast went on to so many amazing things like there's not one person in that cast who as it had a fantastic career um ying fang was in Mm -hmm. our was in our opera yeah Um, and that's just one um and it's in vienna virginia it's and i remember that you know i met a young artist who shall remain nameless a tanner who said to me he was trying to impress me and said I want you to know that I'll be singing in Vienna for the summer. And I said, oh, really? What will, what will you be singing there? Because Vienna in July, and, and maybe we, I'll come hear you and what you're doing. And I said, and then I'll take you out for Wienerschnitzel or Zachertort or something like that. And he said, no, I think I'll be busy. And I said to him, you're singing in Wolf Trap, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. And I said, well, that's terrific. And then one day you'll sing in Vienna, Austria. Sure. <laughs> but 
Um, it's a very particular environment at Wolf Trap because the level is very, very high. It was fantastic. It was I, I had but such it, a great summer there. But it's not necessarily known at the level I think it should be. It's known think, in our business, but I don't know yeah. that it's known in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely the place to go, like Marlboro is in the summer. It's yeah. You know, if you live in that area, you know about it. But yeah, I don't know if it has outside of the opera world. But it's not Tanglewood or Santa Fe in the summer where people make their trips and they know they're going to Tanglewood or Santa Fe. Yeah. If you live in like Washington, D.C. or nearby, you go to Vienna, Virginia. Yeah. I also think it's uh, the density of the outputs. You know, you could go to uh, three days in Santa Fe and see, have three nights of different operas. Three operas, yeah. The Wolf Trap isn't set up that way, but. Now let's go home to Italy. Um, you said you were in Rome for six years. That was at the Accademia di Santa Cecilia. Not for all six. No, that was just my last. What else were you doing? Um, well, oddly enough, <laughs> uh, it's all starting to come full circle. Um, I had uh, been on faculty at a university in the United States, and I was very young when I started there and probably wasn't the right job for me at the time. I had just finished uh, grad school. Um, the faculty didn't really see me as a peer or a colleague because of my age, not that they should have, but somewhat of a colleague. I, I won the audition, I won the job. Um, and it just wasn't, it wasn't the right time for me to be a teacher. I was very, very much closer in age to my students than I was to my mm -hmm. peers. Um, and so I moved to Italy and I started working with an agency. I wanted to be an agent and I thought, okay, this is a, I'm young. This is, this will be a clean break. Um, and it was all well and good. A month or so went by and um, I get a call on a Saturday morning from my boss and we were about to host some like big cattle call auditions for the day. Uh, Sean, our pianist, I can't remember now what happened. Death in the family, train strike, I, can't, I don't remember. Um, we don't have a pianist for these auditions. Um, I know you said you were a pianist. You have to play these auditions. And I said, oh no, I, I don't do that anymore. I said, I'll <laughs> give me give me the list. We'll split it in half. I'll, I'll make phone calls. We'll get a pianist. He said, no, I called everyone. You have to play. We can't, you know, mm -hmm. they don't want to make, they don't want to end up with egg on their face. And I said, okay, this is a one-time thing. Please, I'm trying to not do that anymore. Sure enough, by the end of the day, singers asking if they could work with me. Could I coach? Could I get them ready for this or that? And before you know it, I was back into it. So the universe had it, mm -hmm. had a plan for me. Um, but yeah, that was the very beginning. I slowly started coaching. I played uh, voice lessons with a really fantastic teacher, and I met a lot of wonderful singers that way. And I slowly started coaching and and playing, you know, working in opera houses again. Um, you know, it is possible for the head of an opera company that you one day will be to also be musical and play the piano. I recently was invited to an event in New York. Matthias Schultz, who's the head of the opera in Berlin and is soon moving to Zurich to the opera there. He and I have been friends for years. And he came to New York to help um, promote the American Friends of the Berlin Staatsoper, Unter den Linden. And Michal Bola, the great German baritone, was in New York, was singing Falstaff at the Met. And on a night off, for a group of people who were gathered and in the German ambassador's uh, residence or consul general's residence, um, they did Winterreise. And the head of the opera company in Berlin played a very, very, very commendable performance of that difficult Schubert music which is not easy to pull off singing. it's not easy to pull off jet lag the whole thing sure. um and for people who know America Dr. Ruth Westheimer was in the front row Dr. Ruth Westheimer being a 94 year old uh, survivor of she fled Germany as a child sure. she's America's leading sex therapist <laughs> she, and she was in the front row and and you know she's as much a celebrity as Michal Vola in New York, 
probably more. And but the point is, I think it's very important that the head of an opera company bring strong musical values and preparation. And um, Matthias Schultz certainly has that. That's why you're still young and you are building, you're prematurely gray, but you're still young. You are building um, this, this sort of um, resume, this curriculum that covers almost every part of opera production from <laughs> artist <laughs> management to choral direction, to conducting, to coaching, to repertory programming and so on. And, you know, I don't know if you planned that at the beginning of your career or whether your career took you kind of like a bumblebee in a, in a field of flowers or a honeybee, not a bumblebee, in a field of flowers, each flower providing a different nectar, but ultimately you're the one making the honey. And um, did, did you, at the start of your career, say, this is what I want to do in opera, or you you got your foot in the door and you did what was available to you. This was none of this was intentional. <laughs> um, I certainly, as a young person, when I was finishing my studies, ever thought that my trajectory would have gone the way it went. Um, I don't have that many regrets. I'm very happy with how things have gone and I've enjoyed every adventure that I've been on and there've been many, um, but no, I never, I never would have thought as a younger person that I would have zigzagged the way I have through really a lot of different facets of, of this industry. Um, I'm a Gemini. I have like just a little bit of the grass is greener syndrome. And so I'm always, if I, you know, I'm doing my thing and I see someone else, you know, a different skill set doing something and I become fascinated and I want to learn more and I want to learn more. And before I know it, I'm kind of doing it too. And then I just find myself in the middle of it. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I try to not say no to things. I try to stay open and you know, everything happens for a reason. This, this will be interesting. But also, you know, in an opera career, there are people who opt to put down roots in a place, whether it's in New York City or a smaller place and build their lives from there. Your life being married to someone whose work brought him elsewhere um, meant that you went where his work was. He came to where your work was in mm -hmm. Omaha. Exactly. And, and the dog goes with both of you. <laughs> and But the thing is now, in effect, you've been handed an opportunity to live in France, yeah. which is pretty wonderful if I had to pick a place to, I'd like the opportunity to live in for a while. France is right there. Um, and you can work on your French language skills. You can discover how French theaters work and the whole infrastructure of France, which, yes, they're kind of like civil servants, but also strikes are much more prevalent in France and a lot of countries sure. in, in Europe, certainly. No, um, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. there is a vocation for art and creativity in France. It's rather astounding. Yes. And I know that you're newly arrived in France. I'm not going to say what are you doing and what will you do. But what do you want from France? What can she give you? Oh, gosh, there's so much to give. Um, so Toulouse is in the southwest part of France or in Occitanie. Um, it's still just the beginnings of spring, um, but it's been lovely. I love gardening and I love flowers and plants and it's just an embarrassment of riches in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. The food is wonderful, the wine, I don't need to tell you. <laughs> oh, I, I see you've been drinking the whole time. We've been oh, I there. have a glass of, uh, yeah, <laughs> Languedoc. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been really great. I would love, um, we're going to start looking for a house pretty soon. Um, Sam's trial period with his job ends, and so we can put down some actual roots. Um, I look forward to, you know, making music and working in the garden and making dinner for whoever's around to eat and have some well, Let me refine my question then. What can France give you culturally? 
Um, well, that is yet to be discovered. I'm still very much exploring and learning about Toulouse and the, the you know the culture of of theater here. Um, I would, you know, I, I like doing a lot of different things. I have done, and I will continue to do a lot of different things. Um, I'm open to whatever. I I play rehearsals for, you know, Toulouse has a fantastic opera company. Yeah. Um, I, I I look forward to. Uh, to seeing what happens with them. I think also France is particular because the rail system is so good that you can live in Toulouse, but work in Lyon or Dijon or Grenoble or Marseille or Nice, mm -hmm. not to mention Paris, which is further north, or Rennes, which is further north. But the con or Lille, these this country, Strasbourg, which is further in the northeast. Um, the country has so many wonderful opera companies, Bordeaux, and the further to the southwest that um, you can, it's kind of like being in Germany, oh, where absolutely. you can be based in Cologne, but work in about 10 different cities in Germany and be in your own bed at night. Yeah, um, I mean, Montpellier, Toulon, Toulouse, Bordeaux, further to the west, Nice, Monaco, Lyon, and that's just the bottom half of the country. Yeah. And and they're all very accessible. But so I, I really am. It was a. It I was slightly taken aback when I got the news that we were going to be moving um, as quickly as we were, um, just because I like to plan and I like to kind of know what I'm doing. Um, but this has been such a great adventure, and I'm glad that I'm here. Mm -hmm. and I'm glad I have Sam to to be my partner on this adventure but i uh, yep. i'm just nothing but enthusiastic about what's going to happen um ask me a question about france <laughs> um cassoulet, cassoulet. Yes no. <laughs> well cassoulet in the winter i mean that's a wonderful dish uh that's beans and duck and involves tons of preparation um Four different animal fats. Four different animal fats. I mean, basically, when we talk about France, generically, when we talk about fat in France, we sort of look at the country and cut it in four pieces. Mm. And there's butter and dairy and milk fat in the north. There's pork fat, Lyon and, and Strasbourg and to the east. There is goose and duck fat in the southwest. Yeah. And there's olive oil in the southeast. Yeah. And... I, what I find interesting in France gastronomically, obviously it's a magnificent country, is the degree to which there's a certain amount of codification compared to, say, Italy. Mm -hmm. Italy has local traditions and specialties that differ from town to town and kitchen to kitchen. In France, a sauce, grenoblas or sauce to bees or one of those things, is always made the same way. Mm -hmm. And the first first French cookbook I ever got was actually a book of sauces, oh. so 60 sauces. When you learn the sauces, then you could, <laughs> whether you're adding fish or chicken or whatever, then you learn that after. Um, Bernays, all of those things. But uh, to me, I mean, part of what I really love about France is, as, a, as an American, and especially as a New Yorker, is the respect at least philosophically for the individual and the self-determination of the individual we in america talk about our rights and freedoms america obviously we descended one way from england and from the united kingdom because we speak english and we were colonized by them but our constitution and our laws and our sense of rights is really French. And Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin went to France. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America and France have admiration and sometimes hostility toward one another. But it is one of the countries that I feel most American sure. because the philosophy is the same. Um, Bordeaux used to have the oldest American consulate in the world until President Bill Clinton closed it for economic reasons to me that was a horror because mm. 
it was the place where America had access to Europe. And that was open to America when no one else was. And the French helped us in the Revolutionary Wars. And I have very, very strong feelings for France because it may not be as extroverted as Italy. It may not be as class-oriented as the UK, although it's plenty class-oriented as well. But for most people, yes, there's certainly racial oppression and it's horrible in France as it is anywhere. Uh, and I don't minimize that at all because it is certainly a presence in France. But for most people, at least philosophically, the sense that you have rights and benefits as a human is something that's at the core of French philosophy and also the separation of church and state, which we give lip service to in America, but is actually much more active in France. And I think to benefit, it doesn't mean the people should not be religious if they want to be, but that the state should not be cognizant of religion. Mm -hmm. That's really the thing. And if I were to encourage you, I've lived in France, I've studied there, and I feel both very American and occasionally very foreign when I'm in France. Um, there have been few countries where I've had so much self-discovery as I have in France. And that's what I would point you toward at this point in your life and your career. Um, because it's very special for that. And in few countries, do, at least in my experience, do that the way France does it. So... Well, I, I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, and I'll come visit. <laughs> no, please do. Yeah, Sean Kelly, thank you so much. Thank for you, this friend. Wonderful conversation. Thank you. And listeners will follow you in your work, and uh, you know, I know that you will be appearing in all kinds of stages and places and doing different things on what I call Planet Opera, mm -hmm. and it will always be a pleasure to see you. For me thanks well. very much. Thank you for everything. À la prochaine. Sean. Sean. How do you say Sean Kelly in French? Oh, Sean Kelly. Sean Kelly. Sean <laughs> Kelly. Ça va la prochaine fois, Sean Kelly. À la prochaine. <laughs> Au revoir.